thank you uh, ms malika devendra for the introduction and uh, thank you uh, the chamber of uh, tax consultants for inviting me for today's session uh, this is uh, my first session uh, and also a debut session for this year uh, for the ctc i also thank uh, dharan gandhi sir and uh, harish sir for inviting me for the today's session uh with this very brief background i request uh, cs raj to uh, share the ppt and uh, then we will deliberate on the uh, topic for today uh, yeah yes uh, are you, is it visible yeah, it, it is visible you can yeah okay great so yes, uh, yes. we have uh, this topic of overview of uh, annual compliances for companies in the recent times this has become very important and critical for the professionals uh, as well as for the companies because the compliances under companies act have become quite strict in the recent times and uh, as most of the participants would be professionals either working or in practice so they would be aware of the few uh, orders that have been passed by the registrar of companies due to non compliances so i will be my uh, session will be ensuring how we do the compliance and uh, not actually how we mitigate the after we receive a show cause notice from the roc so what preparatory steps and what action points are required that would broadly be the you can say the tone of the session and uh, i'll be covering the annual compliances for companies as well as i'll be covering uh, uh some key checkpoints which uh, even if they are not annual but they are to be kept in mind and the third part of the session will be the thresholds which are there to ensure the compliance so this is not just annual compliances but broadly this cover the compliances under the company law so that is broadly uh, the coverage i am trying my best to cover uh, the private companies and unlisted public companies and wherever possible listed companies but very difficult to cover listed companies because in addition to company law they have to comply with the listing regulation so i will be not covering that for today but wherever possible i will be covering for the companies so we start with the uh, session yeah so these uh, views are my personal views and not of the uh, chamber and um, this is prepared as on date because there are so many changes and amendments that are coming up in the company law so if you refer this ppt at a later point of time then uh, maybe you have to consider the amendments as well okay so uh, yeah yeah so yes so before we discuss we will discuss few very basic things so that you know if there is a chartered accountant or a, a professional who is uh, you can say not acquainted with company law just to bring him at par with the um, professionals who are working in uh, day in day out on this law so we have the type of companies uh, that we have uh, in companies act that is private and public companies so private is further divided into two types of or further types of or further classes of companies we have now the small company which we will discuss then we have the startups which are registered with the dipp we have the one person company um, which is one a member company actually which can have maybe one or two or more directors then we have a section 8 company which uh, can be a private company or a public company and then we have got a government company so these are you can say what is a what are the classes of private company and private companies are basically companies where uh, there is restriction on transfer of shares uh, the company cannot come out with a public issue so broadly there are some restrictions public company we can have a public company as a section 8 company a government company or a not a section 8 company or a government company but a commercial company so broadly these are the categories so um there is a bit of confusion on whether we have a third type of company which is a private company which is a subsidiary of a public company so whether the private company whether this is a third type of a company in my view uh, no there are only two classes of company and a private company which is a subsidiary of a public company will just be a 
private company for the purpose of articles but it will be a public company for the purposes of the company law so wherever we see compliances for unlisted public companies the law will be applicable like example we have got managerial remuneration we have got key managerial personal appointment and we have got many other provisions uh, like independent director woman director or any other criteria the provisions of uh, such provisions will be applicable to a private company which is subsidiary of a public company and this is a very common thing especially in group companies uh, whether anywhere in india that a whole, there is a listed entity and that listed entity has a subsidiary which is a private company and then the status of that company is sometimes a matter actually it was a matter of debate under the company law 1956 but now it is not much because there is a bit of clarity on this because of the proviso to section 2 subsection 71 which talks about the definition of a public company so basic definition of a private company is given in section 2 subsection 68 and public company is defined in section 2 subsection 71 then since we are talking about annual compliances we need to know the annual financial year and annual financial year has been defined in company law luckily in the companies act 2013 because that was not defined in 1956 so we have the financial year which actually means 31st of march straight forward is 31st of march however there is there is a categorization done by the government which states that uh, if there is a um, you can say a company incorporated during uh, 1st of january uh, of a year to 31st of march of the same year that is in the last quarter q4 then the financial year will be the next financial year so if a company gets incorporated on say 18th of january 2023 then the financial year end will be 31st of march 2024 and if a company gets incorporated in the earlier 9 months that is from 1st april 2022 to 31st of december 2022 then the financial year will be 31st of march 2023 that is broadly the provision this is important because then the number of board meetings will count from there then the annual compliances will trigger and many other provisions will be applicable for such kind of companies the government has um, has issued a, a notification whereby private companies and section 8 companies and government companies and also ifsc companies there is an exemption granted by the government and uh, there are two notifications for me and i'll be referring these at uh, wherever required so uh, there is a notification dated 5th of june 2015 and uh, 13th of june 2017 so under these two notifications there is a uh, exemption granted to the uh, private companies section 8 companies and government companies just to give some more basic background quickly the companies act was applicable from 1st of april 2014 and uh, to be very honest the companies act was not uh, the companies act was not so Uh, you can say so vibrant and so so much amended uh, in the previous uh, law it was uh, uh, i don't actually remember having a session uh, on annual compliances uh, in the previous law because it was not complicated and it was not that difficult but in the pre present law yes it has become a bit challenging and there are many new uh, compliances which have been introduced by the company by the government in this act so yeah we move to the next uh, yeah yeah small company is important because there are some exemptions and um, uh, and also thresholds and the threshold is quite high means comparatively quite high uh, whereby they can take certain exemptions under the company law though the exemptions are not very significant but yes there are some exemptions to it so the first is uh, that a small company obviously needs to be a private company and uh, it uh, it can it shall have a maximum paid up capital up to 4 crores and a turnover up to 40 crores so if both the conditions are satisfied then only uh, it is a small company but only thing over here is the paid up capital in the definition of a small company is not as on a particular date 
means not as on 31st of March or any other date. It can be at any point of time. However, the turnover should be as on a particular date, that is 31st of March of a year, which is 40 crores. So there are some higher thresholds, but the effective thresholds are uh, paid up capital, which is 4 crores and turnover, which is 40 crores in the, uh, for the private company. However, the private company will not include a holding company, subsidiary company, section eight company, and a government and a, and a uh, company under a specific law. So typically in a group company or a section eight company, this is not appeal. So where does this actually affect the professionals is the most important place is where there are certifications involved. So even a uh, AOC four MGT seven of a holding company, subsidiary company, section eight company, we have to get it certified from a practicing professional wherever required because certifications is a big exemption to the small companies. So government is promoting the self-certification, but this is one of the cases. So small companies, section eight company, remember section eight is not a small company because you have to accordingly prepare the documents for such kind of companies. Okay. So we come to the uh, next uh, slide. Yeah. So we now actually come to the uh, compliances and uh, I personally feel uh, this is a very important, uh, uh, important and the first uh, compliance which is required, which is the disclosure by disclosure of interest by directors. This actually comes out from section 166 of the Companies Act, which talks about duties of director and uh, in duties of director, disclosure of interest and disclosure of conflict of interest is a very important aspect. Now, the how it is to be done is provided in the rules and in section 184 of the Companies Act. Now, here there is a prescribed form which talks about and it says that it is to be obtained from all the directors. Now, in uh, section 184, there are certain entities that have been disclosed. In fact, in section 184 is divided into two parts. Subsection 1 talks about the uh, you can say disclosures, which are annual disclosures. Okay. And subsection two talks about event based disclosures. Suppose in the interim year, a disclose uh, interest is created, means the director gets appointed as a director in another company, or uh, there is a change in director in another company where there are common directors. Then in that case, the provisions of uh, section 184, subsection two will trigger. So this without going into the nitty gritties of it, in my view, section 184 needs to be complied holistically uh, without finding an exemption for it because it ultimately relates to section 166, which talks about duties of director and which actually comes from the English company law. So in this case, I feel, uh, so for example, just to give you an example, if a director of a company is a, trustee in a hospital, or if he is a director or a president in a particular chamber, or if he is a, a non-executive director in a, a small private company, if he is a, a, you can say, head of department in a particular college, or if he is a trustee of a particular trust. In my view, all these, all these disclosures are required to be disclosed by the director. Now, uh, no, the, the earlier slide, sorry. So, yeah, so all these are to be disclosed in the uh, MBP one, because uh, this actually talks about uh, that there, there could be some occasions where, uh, you know, uh, disclosures, you may think that these are not required under the company law, but the wordings are quite wide enough for the same. Now, there are three occasions where you have to obtain the disclosures. First occasion is the finance start, start of the financial year or the first board meeting of the financial year. Second is whenever a director is appointed and the third when there is a change in the interest of a director. Say he is resigned from a company or he gets appointed or there is reappointment in that case. In the first board meeting, it is desirable that, not desirable, but it is necessary that it is considered by the companies. So whenever I say companies, it, is, it includes all companies, whether it is a private, public, listed, unlisted, uh, because some compliances are common for all companies and it is uh, desirable that you pass a resolution for the same that the disclosure of interest has been taken on record. So that is necessary. Now the date of declaration is very important over here. 
typically in the case of uh, first board meeting. So suppose the quarter obviously starts in the month of April, but the board meeting is conducted in the month of say 15 on 15th of May or 20th of May. The date of disclosure will be 20th of May because that is the first board meeting of the year. But if there is a, you can say a meeting at a later point of time, that can also be a situation, but that could be the date of board meeting. So do we need to file MBB1 and DRA with MCA? No, they are not required to be filed with the MCA. Um, uh, earlier there was a provision, but they have amended the law and now they are not required to be disclosed. Yeah, so we come to the uh, next point, which is, uh, yeah, this is regarding a disqualification. So to ensure that the directors are qualified to be directors under section 164, there is a DIR 8. So there is a minor change over here required. Uh, so I'll be sharing a revised PPT and that can be uploaded on the uh, website. So um, yeah, I'll take all the questions collectively, but you can post all the questions and uh, I'll be taking all the questions uh, for the same. So uh, this is also another uh, declaration which is required. Uh, interestingly, section 164 doesn't talk about this declaration. Also, the rules don't talk about this declaration, but since there is a requirement for a chartered accountant who is a statutory auditor of the company to give a declaration or to uh, provide it in the audit report that whether directors are disqualified or qualified uh, or not disqualified, they are required to, uh, th th this declaration is obtained. And I feel it is a uh, good practice to have it in the first board meeting or whenever possible. However, uh, this declaration would be as on the year end because uh, it will be um, as per the financial statements and the audit report, which is um, done by the statutory auditor or finalized by the auditor by the auditor of the company. So generally these are on, as on the year end that is 31st of March or 31st of December of the year. So yeah, again, there is no exemption for any director. They have to obtain. Interestingly, there was, now where does this actually come from? This declaration or disqualification comes under section 164, subsection two. And the subsection two was quite litigated during the year 2017, 2018, when the MCA had issued, um, yeah. So when the MCA had issued, um, uh, you can say a circular and then quite a few companies were uh, deregistered uh, as shell companies because they had not filed the financial statements. Then they filed a writ before the high court. So there are judgments of the Delhi High Court, Bombay High Court, Madras High Court, and uh, all these writs are now pending before the Supreme Court uh, to conclude on disqualification of directors under section 164, subsection 2. So what is the situation or what was the issue? I'll just quickly summarize so that, you know, this is not a purely compliance lecture, but also some, you can say, a validation in terms of the matter that is going on, uh, the litigation that is going on this particular in this particular section. So what had happened is there were companies which had defaulted uh, in the, there were private companies and public companies that had defaulted in the, um, in the companies act 1956. So there was a default in the year 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. Okay. So if you go by the provisions of the law, the law provides that the, you should not default for a continuous period of three years. Here, the continuous period of three years, has elapsed and it has been five years. Interestingly, this provision of section 164 was, the corresponding provision was section 274-1G of the Companies Act 1956. But that was applicable only to public companies and not private companies. But from 1st of April 2020, uh, to, uh, 2014, the law became applicable to private companies. But the number of years of default was only two years for a private company, which was 2015 and 2016. And before that, there was a default of 2017, the government had uh, struck down the uh, companies um, under the, uh, you can say, considering that they are not, and the directors were disqualified. So there were two uh, actions that were taken by the government. This was challenged before the High Court. 
Now, presently, uh, there are quite a few amendments that government had introduced, but that was that is basically a background to this particular provision. So, this is a very important provision, uh, uh, and there is a lot of fact finding required for uh, such kind of um, uh, compliance to be done. Yeah. So we can. Yeah. So this is DIR eight. I, I will send the revised PPT later on. Okay, so uh, we can go to the next, yeah. So there is the another compliance which the government has introduced in the year 2017-2018 is E-Form DPT-3. Now, if there are, th th there would be practicing professionals and uh, just recently they would have completed the compliance for this uh, E-Form. Basically, this uh, form was introduced or this compliance was introduced because government had observed that there was a lot of uh, money uh, with the companies, but it was not appropriately accounted for and was not appropriately reported for. So the most common example, uh, there are two common examples in this, why, for, why, this, is, uh, why this was introduced is uh, because um, uh, the, the the companies had share application money pending allotment and this was pending for around 10 years, 15 years, 20 years in the balance sheet of the company. But uh, what had happened was uh, this, this was one. Second was uh, loans from directors and loan from directors relative. This was another compliance which was there. So therefore, uh, to ensure that there is reporting done, uh, by the companies that introduced the e-form DPT-3. In DPT-3, it's not only exempted deposit, it is also deposits which are reported by the companies. So it is applicable to all companies, including Section 8 companies and uh, private companies, public companies, government companies. In fact, for government companies, there is a provision in the rules, but all companies except banking company, non-banking financial companies, uh, some uh, entities which are regulated by RBI, or which are separately regulated, they need not comply with the provisions of DPT-3. Then there are 18 transactions that are to be reported uh, to be uh, to the government and all information should be as on 31st of March. This is very important. Uh, I think so there is uh, rule 16 which talks about this particular, uh, rule 16 of the acceptance of deposit rules which talks about this. What it actually says is that Anything outstanding as on 31st of March of every year needs to be reported by June 30th. That is broadly the wording. But what has happened is uh, there are quite a few companies which don't have a financial year of 31st of March. Generally, US-based companies or European subsidiaries, they have financial year as on 31st of December. But only for the purpose of DPT-3, it uh, has a, you can say, uh, 31st of March as the cutoff date. So this is one important aspect which is there for exempted deposits. Yeah. And then we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> yeah. So there are uh, compliances. Uh, I've, I've selected a few uh, important points which, you know, whether it is a private company, public company, these issues are always there. Uh, typically for a closely held public com private company or a uh, public company. So any amount received from the person who at the time of receipt was a director of a company or a relative of a director of a private company. So company can raise money or raise funds or take a loan from director of a company, whether that company is a public company or a private company. If it is to be taken from a director's relative, then it can only be a private company and not a public company. There is a requirement in the law, which is a proviso to this, which says that it should be from owned funds and a director should give a declaration. And in what we do as a practice is that we take it as a, we take it on record and we include it in the minutes of meeting that is to be done. Yeah, so uh, basically uh, there is an interesting question which says that uh, should DPT-3 be filed for nil uh, borrowings or nil uh, amount in my view, if the outstanding is zero, then there is no requirement of filing e-form DPT-3. 
if uh, there is something outstanding, then only it is required. Because if you go by the wording of the section uh, of the rules, which is uh, acceptance of deposit rules, it specifically talks about uh, out, there is a specific word which is uh, outstanding in the rules and in the form. So therefore, that is to be done. Yeah, loans to directors. Yeah, I'll just come to that loans to directors in just some time because this is loans from directors and that is loan to directors. So there are two different provisions for it. So uh, what it actually talks that uh, directors of a company, private or public, and director of a uh, director's relative of a private company. So borrowing companies also need to be seeing at least the resolution under section 179 needs to be passed. There is reporting to be done in the financial statements and the notes to accounts. And there is also um, disclosures to be made in the board's report. That is another important aspect in the uh, for this particular. Now, uh, on this point only, there is always a question whether private company can take unsecured loans from its shareholders who are neither directors and not directors relative. In my view, yes, you can do that. Uh, there is a provision given in the notification 5th June 2015, where if we comply with the conditions, there are three conditions. And if we comply with it, not all, but if we comply with any one condition, we can take the loan from shareholders of the company. So there is a provision to that effect in the provision. So I'll just uh, check, but yeah, I'm just seeing where the specific provision, but it's given in the notification of 5th June 2015, where private company can take loan from the members of the company. But important aspect over here is that needs to be reported in DPT-3 as well. Because, um, yeah, uh, if you see point number six of that uh, clause, it says that the certain provisions shall not apply. And there are three, any three conditions satisfied, the private company can take a loan from its shareholders, which was the case in Company Act 1996. Okay, so we come to the next point. Yeah, uh, then, yeah, the next slide. Yeah, then we, this is also a very common transaction in inter-corporate deposits. So what it actually relates to is a transaction or a loan given by any amount received by a company from any other company. So private company giving a loan to a private or a public company or a public company giving loan to a private or a public company. Obviously, both companies in India, not uh, ECB, uh, there should be a lending authorization uh, by the lending entity. And um, then there is a borrowing authorization, which is also required. Uh, then there are there, there ought to be, it is desirable that there is an agreement to that effect of loan that is borrowed. And uh, most importantly, whether section 185 will be applicable, uh, considering the definition of deposit, which includes loan and uh, taking into consideration uh, section 185, which talks about common director and loan given by one company to another company where there is a common director. In my view, it will amount to, uh, it will require the compliance of 185. However, if there are, if there are no applicable provisions or conditions of 185 not, uh, is not applicable, then the compliance is not necessary. But if there are common directors, then the provisions of 185 will be applicable. So you have to read this particular rule or sub rule with 185, which talks about common director. And then we need to comply uh, with section 185 as well. <coughs> okay. Hmm. Yeah, this is a very important aspect for uh, all professionals and startups. This is an excellent way of raising money for startups. Uh, this is provided in the deposit rules. Interestingly, only in the deposit rules, not in section or uh, some different provisions under the prospectus and allotment or share capital and debenture rules. So what it says is that a company can raise a minimum amount. Now, when I say a company, it is a startup, DIBP registered startup entity. The amount is uh, 25 lakhs or more. Okay. And uh, the amount, the 
there is a conversion there is a it is raised for a period of 10 more 10 years and uh, it can be either converted or it can be redeemed but that call will be at the discretion uh, and will be dependent on the uh, the uh, you can say the occurrence of some events so that is at the option of the holder that is there so it can be either converted or it can be redeemed uh, that so much of option and so much of leeway is given for raising of funds by the startup only thing is it should be more than 25 lakhs yeah, means this is one of the provision which talks about a higher amount and not a lesser amount so these are convertible notes so if a convertible note is issued or there is a proposal to issue it is desirable that there is a uh, agreement to that effect before the funds are obtained and such kind of agreement and transaction is approved under section 62 subsection 3 of the companies act which talks about conversion of loan into shares which talks of conversion of a loan into shares after the resolution is passed the convertible notes can be issued by the company but this needs to be reported in the form dpt3 all the three transactions which we discussed needs to be reported in the dpt3 and there are other 15 transactions but these three are very important therefore it is yeah so we can come to the next point yeah so i'll take all the questions maybe in just uh, some time uh, uh, maybe is it fine maybe after some 10 15 minutes after i cover some uh, part of the presentation sir. so we can take them together at the end if that okay, is okay, okay. and okay, you can okay. carry on with the flow of the sessions okay 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 yeah yes yes yeah okay so next yeah this is the next one sir intercorporate deposit yeah after this yeah after this yeah so th this is another compliance which i always feel is important and whether it is a company secretary or a chartered accountant uh, whether a cost accountant or an advocate who is into corporate law compliance in my view this is a very important provision that we need to be absolutely thorough and uh, need to consult our clients or our companies where they are taking a decision on such matters so these matters uh, are to be discussed only at a board meeting and not by circular resolution and there are few dispute matters and there are there are few case laws on these particular points the background of this is that all these all these points require uh, the matters to be discussed in the uh, board meeting there there these are not points which you know that can be just approved by a circular resolution without discussion but they require a detailed deliberate del deliberation on these points and therefore these are included in a specifically in a board meeting agenda so what it actually talks is that uh, yeah so what it actually relates what it actually talks is that uh, if there is a call to be made it requires a board meeting if there is a buyback to be done it can be discussed in a board meeting if a company proposes to issue securities whether under the rights basis or private placement it requires to be done in case of the following three they can be delegated but the initial decision needs to be taken by the board with some limit on it and it can be delegated to a committee or a person or a cfo or a md but that delegation should be there and then the person should report to the uh, board on a regular basis that is what is the provision therefore there is an asterisk for the three points but these three are very important company can borrow money so there can be a borrowing committee also but initial borrowing limit can be set up by the board of directors okay so initial borrowing money can be set up by the board of directors same applies for the investment of funds and grant of loan or giving of guarantee so that that is all required and that can be delegated as well however initial resolution needs to be passed by the board of directors approval of financial statements and board report this cannot be done by circular resolution and therefore a physical board meeting is required and uh, yeah so we come to the next few agenda items 
Yeah. If a company proposes to engage in a different business or there is a corporate restructuring happening or if a company proposes to give a political contribution or the company proposes to appoint a KMP, which includes a CEO, CFO, company secretary, full-time director, managing director. So if there is an appointment for any of this, it requires the board meeting approval at a, a board approval at the board meeting. And internal aud auditors and statutory secretarial auditors can also be appointed only in a board meeting. Interesting to note that um, not in this section, but in some other section, there is a reference of appointment in section 139. It talks about appointment of a uh, statutory auditor. In that case, uh, there is a provision to that effect. But basically, uh, whether you are an internal auditor or a secretarial auditor or a statutory auditor, it is always better to see that these resolutions are passed at a board meeting. Now, this is on, these are only the transactions given in section 179. But if you go to section 186, which talks about board approval for investment loan guarantee, if you go to section 188, which talks about RPT, all this requires approval at a board meeting. So these are minimum transactions and there are more transactions to that effect. So uh, it is an important aspect that you that we review it. And uh, so uh, whichever audit that we do, uh, first that we ask is the board meeting minutes because that gives us the idea about uh, how the uh, transactions have been done and what authorities are given. So, yeah, yeah, we can, yeah. So uh, earlier for uh, private companies uh, for the first year, MGT 14 was applicable to, uh, for filing. All, the, all, all that was passed by the, whether a private company or a public company was required to be filed with the government uh, through MGT 14. But then the 5th June notification gave an exemption saying that such reporting will not be required under section 117 of the Companies Act. And therefore, we have now MGT 14 that is to be filed only by public companies, whether a private uh, listed entity or an unlisted entity. They need to file MGT 14 for all the earlier 13 transactions which are there uh, in e form MGT 14. Okay. So, yeah, this is another important compliance, which is there. This is actually a topic in itself and I will not be going very much in detail, but yeah, if there are questions I can definitely take, but I will just give a brief overview of this RPT, which is under the company that what this actually relates to is that there are, there are three requirements for uh, this RPT uh, section 188 to be applicable. First is that there should be a transacting company. Second is the transaction should be with a related party. Related parties have been defined in section two, subsection 76. Okay. Other than that, related parties are also defined in some other law, like the accounting standards, SEBI regulation. However, for section 188, only section two, subsection 76 are applicable. And the third point is, it should be a transaction under a company law. So what is the type of transaction is given in section 188 subsection one? There are seven types of transactions which have been listed over here. Now, when, whenever a company enters into a transaction with a related party for a transaction which is prescribed, then only section 188 will be applicable. To give an example, if a company is engaged in the business of automobiles, and it gives a loan to a related party. Then, in my view, it will not be a pro. It will not be a transaction under Section 188, but it will be a transaction under Section 185, because uh, this actually talks about availing and rendering of services. And when it talks about availing and rendering of services. Uh, the company is not engaged in the business of availing and rendering automobile services uh, or finance services. It is engaged in the business of automobile services. Yeah, am I audible now? Yes, it is clear, sir. Okay. Clear. Yeah, sorry. So, um, 
therefore if a company is engaged in some other business then that would not require the approval under 188 so first it requires an approval at a board meeting it may require an approval of the shareholders if it is crossing the thresholds and then it may require the audit committee approval as well under section 177 however if a transaction is in the ordinary course of business and on arm's length basis right both are uh, you can say a bit subjective ordinary course of business is a business which as i probably just, just discussed that it is a automobile company but giving a one time loan to its uh, group companies then that is not something uh, which is a service but maybe an ordinary course because this they have been doing it for quite some time right and arm's length basis is something which they are doing it on arm's length transaction level and the interest rate is complied the borrowing term and conditions are complied and considering that it complies with the uh, you can say uh, the provision that they apply to the non-related parties which apply to the related party and therefore it may be on arms in basis now if all this is complied practically uh, section 188 will not be applicable if the transaction is in the ordinary course of business and on arms in basis so both conditions are to be satisfied however this call is to be taken by the board of directors and board of directors need to take it on record that it is on, how it is on uh, on arms in basis and how it is in the ordinary course of business. If that is done, then probably the transaction will just require a noting or the approval of the board. And maybe we may not require the shareholders approval as well. So like typically, if you see the second last point, the company pays remuneration to the executive director or non-executive director, whether it is a private or a public company. So this is against the services they render. Okay. But paying remuneration to the directors is in the ordinary course of business because there is a corresponding provision in the law and how much you pay to the directors is to be decided by the company so that is arm's length basis judgment that is applied if both is done then it will require just the board approval or a board noting that the transaction are in the ordinary course of business and arm's length basis so that is how section 188 is there. But section 188 is not a section in itself. The consequence of section 188 is a maintenance of register under section 189. So if uh, there is a RPT which is done, uh, then they need to enter it in the register. And then the register needs to be placed uh, before the directors for signing and all that compliance is to be done. But the important part over here is, if a transaction is in the ordinary course of business and arm's length basis, then it is out of 188. Since it is out of 188, provisions of section 189 will not get triggered. But therefore, entry will not be required. That is broadly what I, what I wanted to uh, sum up over here. Interesting part over here is, one more point is, if there is a private company in India, which is a subsidiary company or an associate company of a foreign entity, Okay, so in that case, uh, the private company uh, can take an exemption under the 5th June notification that since it is not a related party, uh, that is the holding company, subsidiary company, uh, fellow subsidiary, associate company, these are not related parties. Even if they enter into transaction with such companies, they will not require any uh, approval of RPT because it doesn't satisfy the three conditions the company enters into a transaction, the transaction is a prescribed transaction, but the transaction is not with a related party. Because the by the 5th June notification, these are not related parties under the Companies Act for a private company only. Okay. There could be some questions, but we can take it up uh, in the Q&A session. Yeah. So the, now the provision talks about issue of shares on DMAT. So this was introduced in 2018. I remember it was 2nd of October when the provisions were introduced uh, by the government. This was the second cleanup that was introduced by the, um, by the government. Uh, first was the action against the uh, defaulting companies or the um, shell companies. 
second was the uh, demat that was introduced so therefore they had introduced the rule 9a in the prospectus and allotment rules what it says is that this is applicable only to unlisted public companies that they need to have shares in demat form and the company cannot issue further shares if the shares of promoters directors kmps are not in demat form so uh, first they need to do that also and they need to facilitate for the existing securities so quite a few registrar and share transfer agents are uh, providing this service of uh, facilitating the demat of existing securities typically in maharashtra i can say uh, there are quite a few sugar uh, manufacturing sugar sugar companies so they have been largely affected by this particular provision because the cost factor of dematerializing the securities that is one second is um, there are few public companies uh, who are not able to facilitate the demat of securities uh, typically companies based in very rural area where uh, the farmers don't have a login id password for creating opening a demat account and then having the shares so all those are operational issues but typically in tier 2 tier 3 cities or tier 1 city this is not a big challenge only challenge is doing the compliance so they need to means a practicing professional needs to certify that company has complied with the provisions of the section 29 there are certification by two professionals any one professional can certify practicing chartered accountant or a practicing company secretary certified provisions are not applicable to nidhi company government company and wholly owned subsidiary so this wholly owned subsidiary is exempted from compliance in day to day practice we may see uh, there are quite a few companies which are subsidiaries but not wholly owned subsidiaries so i'll just like to spend just 2 to 3 minutes on the wholly owned subsidiary because the reference of wholly owned subsidiary is given in section 185 it is also in section 186 and it is also in section 188 and also rule 9a and many other provisions in the company law so how does a subsidiary become a wholly owned subsidiary is a very important aspect because i remember there was a judgment of the uh, delhi high court uh, in a tax matter where uh, there was a transfer of a particular asset by the by the foreign entity um, that is the parent entity to its subsidiary in india and had it been a wholly owned subsidiary it was exempt from capital gains that was broadly the provision i am not an expert in uh, uh, taxation so i can't uh, talk a lot on it but going by the facts of the case if it was a wholly owned subsidiary capital gain was exempted if it was a subsidiary then the capital gains were applicable the company claimed that it was a wholly owned subsidiary obviously to say that it is uh, capital gains is not applicable however the company had not complied with the provisions of erstwhile section 187c of companies act 1956 and they had not filed the requisite forms with the uh, registrar of companies to convert that uh, subsidiary into a wholly owned subsidiary and uh, therefore uh, this um, issue was there and therefore the company was liable to pay the capital gain so what is broadly required to make it a wholly owned subsidiary there are only two things that are to be done first is ensure compliance of section 189 uh, section 89 not 189 89 which provides for uh, filing of mgt 345 or uh, yeah 345 with the uh, so there is a concept of registered owner there is a concept of beneficial owner okay if there is a registered owner the second holder in the company will be the registered owner but the beneficial owner will be the holding company that needs to be reported to the company that who is a registered owner who is the beneficial owner then the company needs to report it to the government uh, in the form mgt 5 or 6 e form mgt 5 or 6 then that goes on record and then it becomes a wholly owned subsidiary that is broadly the situation of forming a wholly owned subsidiary typically this is applicable in the case of incorporation of companies or uh, probably it is a wholly owned subsidiary but the compliance is not done i had a very interesting case very recently 
that there was a municipal corporation of a uh, city in Maharashtra, and that was holding virtually the entire share capital of a uh, metro company in uh, in Maharashtra. Okay, and the comp metro company was a public company, so it had seven shareholders, and all the six shareholders were all the elected representatives and uh, the nominees of the. Um, the corporation and also whether it is a mayor or leader of opposition and all those six persons were there. But interestingly, they were holding the shares in the personal capacity and not in the capacity of the PMC or the municipal corporation. Therefore, what happened the issue before me was that whether it is a wholly owned subsidiary or not a wholly owned subsidiary, the consideration for the share was paid by the municipal corporation but the shares were still there in the name of those individual persons. So the only pending compliance that was required was the uh, compliance of sec uh, section 89, which required MGT 3, 4, 5 related compliance to be done. And then, uh, then, they would, then they can take the benefit of this particular reason. So, that is, so there are many, many instances which come up typically in the present situation for the wholly owned subsidiary. And not just for this, there are many other provisions that you can take uh, advantage or benefit of because of the wholly owned subsidiary. Yeah, so we can come to the next slide. Yeah, so very relevant question asked by Ms. Preeti that if uh, there is a joint shareholding, I'll come to all questions. So I'll just, uh, there is one relevant question, which is there, if the shares are held jointly, whether it will uh, suffice the compliance of beneficial owner? In my view, no, because even where the shares are held jointly, uh, the joint shareholder is an independent shareholder. Only thing by articles, it may or may not have the voting rights, but it inherently has all the rights of a shareholder. Only thing in the sequence is the second holder. So even joint shareholding will not suffice this compliance. In my view, the compliance under 89 would be required. Yeah, I forgot to take that point in my discussion. Great. So I'll come to all questions uh, collectively. So then the most of y'all are aware about the, yeah, uh, most of y'all are aware about the compliance of uh, DR, DR KYC which is to be done by 30th of September uh, for the uh, DINs which are generated before 31st of March. So you have the next six months for the compliance. For the first time, we have to do the compliance through the e-form. And for the if there is no change in the details, then we can do the compliance on web-based for the remaining years. Whenever there is a change required in the mobile number or any email address, that time we have to again find the e-form. So, this is all, you can say all the provisions of the law, but to give a very quick background to this was that earlier, um, there was a situation where uh, one director was having an anonymous email ID or an email ID of a person which was the office email ID. And the director obviously may or may not have access to such, kind, such email ID. It was not, not his personal email ID, but a common ID. And that created an issue where company, where the government had to issue, uh, you can say a show cause notice to the companies or the directors. And therefore, there was no specific email ID to which they can address. Therefore, they had uh, introduced this compliance that at least there can be a seamless communication by the ministry to the directors about the any, if at all there is any non-compliance done by it. So there is a question that is asked that if there is no change, yeah, if there is no change, then still the KYC is required, but that would be a web-based KYC and not a form-based KYC. So in the point number two and point number, uh, point number two, there is a reference of web-based KYC. But for the first, it will be the, uh, for the first, it would be, for the first time, it would be the form-based KYC. Okay. Yeah, so then there are some board meeting related compliance. I'll not go very much in detail because there are some more things that are to be discussed. And this is 
this we can discuss at any point of time but basically the every company needs to conduct a first board meeting in the first 30 days and uh, after that it should have four board meetings in a year uh, and there it should be a gap of minimum 120 days between the two meetings now the board meeting can be conducted in person or through vc and the quorum for that will be counted for both whether you conduct it through vc or in person it you can have a board meeting and that will be a valid board meeting and that will be a valid quorum as well so that will be compliance of the law as well yeah yeah with respect to the number of meetings uh, some companies like opc a small company or a dormant company they can have uh, one board meeting in the first six months and the second in the second six months but the gap should be more than 90 days so these are some uh, compliances that can be taken care of and most of the professionals are aware of it so i'll not go into the nitty gritties of it but yeah that is one compliance that is an annual compliance therefore it is part of the presentation yeah now since now everybody is now acquainted to the vc whether it is the chamber of tax consultant for the lecture meetings or whether it is companies for the board meetings or whether it is uh, schools for the uh, students or whether it is colleges for the students we are now acquainted post covid uh, for um, yeah for uh, for the uh, for post covid we are more acquainted for the vc meetings so we will discuss a bit about vc meeting because it has become the norm and not an exception and i'll take the question on the section 8 company also so safeguard integrity uh, of the board meeting so basically it should be a secured meeting uh, most of the times uh, or the first time the director has asked that can we have a board meeting through whatsapp call and all so it may be secured but it cannot be recorded so it is always desirable that it is recorded and uh, it is secured that is more important so to ensure the integrity we have to maintain the records of the meeting which has been recorded at least up to the audit of that year so if the financial year is 21 sorry 22 23 and the audit gets completed um, and the audit gets completed in say suppose in the month of july august 2023 then it would require the um, uh, minutes to be sorry it would require the recording of the meeting to be maintained up to the audit that is complete so 12 months plus the next three four months the records needs to be maintained this is a very important aspect because uh, most of the times they are not maintained or they are maintained on the hard disk and or the hard drive and there is they are not traceable at a later point of time so at least for the board meetings they need to be formal board meeting they need to be maintained so it should be an audio visual meeting so it is should not be a monologue or a audio meeting so it should be an audio visual meeting and differently able persons can be accompanied by other person with the approval of the board that is also provided in the rules yeah so uh, this is a very important compliance that has now become optional earlier uh, if there was a board meeting to be attended through vc uh, there was a requirement of giving a one time declaration saying that you can i will attend the meeting through vc from time to time as provided by the company so it was a compliance at the beginning of the calendar year but now it has been made optional and uh, however this is based on a particular judgment of nclat uh, where there was a dispute between two groups and the board meeting was conducted uh, through VC, but not provided the facility to few directors. So that, that was challenged before the NCLT, and then it went to the appeal before the NCLT. So what was concluded was that attending meeting through v, board meeting through VC was a right of a director, and therefore uh, he can exercise at any point of time. Suppose if today he says that he wants to attend the meeting physically, but at a later point of time, he says that I would like to attend the meeting through VC, then company should provide the facility for VC. And whether or not he gives a declaration that is not relevant, the right to attend meeting is important and therefore uh, that would be required. So a roll call is required and there are some 
there is a procedure to be done. So roll call is required uh, to be uh, given by the directors. Uh, chairman should announce the summary of the decisions. And uh, now practically every, every board meeting can be done through VC because there was rule four of the corresponding rules that provided that for uh, accounts approval, signing, board's report, and few other transactions, this needs to be done in a physical meeting. But now that's been uh, removed and we can have a board meeting. Practically, directors need not meet, means just not practically, but theoretically, directors need not meet for a board meeting. All meetings can be done virtually. But above all the points needs to be complied for the same. Then we come to the annual general meeting. And uh, yeah, so all companies, uh, so AGM more importantly depends on when the company gets incorporated. That is the uh, trigger point for conducting the annual general meetings. What it provides that, that the annual general meeting, just to give a, you can say something in a timeline, the company gets incorporated on 15th of January, 2023. Then the financial year will be 31st of March, 2024. And the last date of conducting the AGM will be 31st of December, 2024. That is broadly what the provisions say in terms of dates. If a company gets incorporated on 18th of July, 2022, then the financial year end will be 31st of March, 2023. And the AGM needs to be conducted by 31st of December, 2023, okay? In the subsequent year, the financial year will be 31st of March, uh, 1st of uh, April, 2023 to 31st of March, 2024. That would be the finance, that subsequent year. That AGM needs to be conducted on or before 30th of September, 2023. Four. That is broadly what is given all over here. So the date of incorporation is a trigger point for the AGM and how it is to be convened or when it is to be convened. So we will first come to the last two points and then come to the first two points. So the first AGM shall be conducted within nine months from the closure of financial year and subsequent AGM, the AGM shall be held within a period of uh, six months from the closure of the financial year. And uh, interestingly, we need to always ensure that gap between two meetings shall not be more than 15 months. So if the meeting was convened just for a particular year, for 31st of March, 2022, it was convened on uh, 15th of May, 2022, in just three, four, two, three months. Then you need to ensure that for 2023, you don't go beyond 15 months. Even if you are allowed, by 30th of September, which is six months, you need to check the 15 months. It may happen that it can be 30th of August or 15th of August or 15th of September. But so you have to balance all to ensure that date. This should be the date on which the meeting is called convene conducted. That is the most important part, right? Okay. So. Now for only the annual general meeting, they have prescribed that so much of timelines. So it should be called between during business hours, nine to six and uh, on any day, but not being a national holiday. And at uh, the registered office or city, town or village where the registered office is situated. Typically this comes a situation in case of Mumbai and Nami Mumbai, that if the registered office is in Mumbai, then can they hold a annual general meeting in Navi Mumbai or vice versa? So the issue is whether Navi Mumbai and Mumbai are cities, independent cities, or it's just an extent. So such kind of issues may come up for the annual general meeting because it may happen that directors are all deciding in Navi Mumbai and due to the rainfall, they can not attend the meeting in Mumbai. So that could be a situation. But interestingly, for the year 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, we can have shareholders meeting through VC. Just like board meetings, we can have the meetings through VC. So it may also happen that both the director shareholders 
or not both only any all the director shareholders are outside india and uh, now obviously they cannot have a meeting to be conducted at a particular place which is mentioned here so they can have a board uh, the annual general meeting through vc and that will be a valid meeting so that is how the agm can be conducted yeah so these are some uh, compliances which are there uh, post agm reporting compliances now since it is an annual compliance session and so i have just mentioned over here so these are some filings to be done about the financial statements the aoc4 which is to be filed within 30 days of agm mdt7 within 60 days but now as compared to 1956 the mdt7 should be as on the financial year end so the data should be as on 31st of march but it should be filed within 6 within 60 days from the date of agm so that is the important part mdt8 if it is applicable adt1 in my view uh, adt1 is required to be filed uh, for even the first auditor of the company uh, considering the provisions of the law uh, there was a confusion in uh, 2017 2018 or probably even before that that adt1 is not applicable to the first auditor but in my view it is not the case um uh, then uh, mdt15 is also required to be is also required uh, for this uh, for listed public companies reporting their agm so mdt15 is a unique other than that there could be a special resolution passed in the agm for which mdt14 is required some more other compliances are required but those are event based compliance and not annual compliance or not common compliance so i have not covered them over here but there could be any compliance like after in the agm they have they have proposed the matter of um, issue of securities on private placement basis then there could be a compliance under section 42 there could be a situation where they take an approval of shareholders for converting loan into shares so that could be the case okay so that is Uh, you can say post agm yeah yeah so these are some important checkpoints for companies all company whether it is a private public section 8 listed or unlisted entity sorry so in the case of um, once the company gets incorporated they need to file a declaration that the subscription money has been received and this declaration is now required under section 10a of the company act the declaration is to be filed within 180 days of the incorporation of the company so uh, in this case um, in case of the commencement of business the company cannot commence till the time they file the forms with the government and therefore uh, they are required to you can say uh, now the compliance what they say is that uh, there is a provision which says not a provision but in the form they say that you have to do it uh, you have to only uh, pay the subscription money through bank account so that is another compliance that they have introduced and now they have introduced the photo of the registered office so compliances with respect to the company incorporation and post incorporation are now are now quite strict enough that they need to comply with respect to the compliance now what why they have made it so strict is <clears throat> there are two reasons there are there were quite a few companies which were incorporated but they didn't do transactions for a period of time for say 4 years 5 years 10 years and suddenly there was a transaction in the company so government thought it that there is something fishy going in the company and therefore they have because they had not introduced capital but they had the company which was there so having such kind of 
the uh, compliances for commencement of business the government is making the compliance is quite strict at the same time they are keeping a check on the shell companies and if at all there is siphoning of funds or anything that they can keep a check right from day one that is probably the intention of the government to make it so strict filing of adt1 it's required in my view and uh, that needs to be the appointment needs to be done within 30 days which everybody knows there is a compliance with respect to maintenance of registered office this is specifically provided in section 12 of the companies act where where they need to give um, affix the name board or paint the name of the company and all those compliances are required interestingly uh now obviously all the companies have the website their own website there is a, a rule 26 of companies incorporation rule uh which talks about the compliances uh, to be done for the website of a company so if the website is maintained we need to mention the name of the company we need to mention the cin of the company person in person name and email id to be given in case of any grievances so that is also a checkpoint to be done even though it is maintenance of registered office it falls under regulation 26 which is the website of a company registered owner benefit you know we just discussed right now with respect to the wholly owned subsidiary sbo compliance is equally important but i'll not go into the detail but whenever there is a corporate shareholder in the company it will trigger the compliance of the sbo now sbo is a topic in itself so maybe some other time uh, the ctc can have a session on this and i think so they already had a session on sbo because i had seen the ppt so sbo is a very important topic and it is now even linked to related parties under the sebi listing regulation okay so we can come to the next point <coughs> okay so uh, compliance of 135 is now equally important with respect to the csr constitution of a committee formation of a policy drafting of a policy and its implementation what is more important which i just got to know about a query from a participant about statutory auditors so now what has happened is now practically we are done with uh, 10 years of companies act uh to uh, 2013 right so from 1st april 2014 to 31st of march 2024 so we are done with around 9 or 10 years of company law of the new company law so what is the most important part over here is that the independent directors which were there who were there for the first 5 years and again they were there for the next 5 years so they have completed the term of 5 years so that you need to ensure similarly for the statutory auditors the statutory auditor there is a provision for retirement by rotation even that needs to be complied so whenever you appoint a auditor for 5 years every time you need to every year every um, you can say whenever there is a change you need to keep a tap of it and see that you comply with the same applies for the director still if you see the provisions of um, section 196 there is a specific provision which is even applicable to private companies that you need to have a tenure of 5 years whether it is an executive director or a managing director there should be a tenure of 5 years now that tenure of 5 years being applicable to private companies we need to ensure the compliance of that as well so keep a tap of such appointments there is one more provision in section 196 subsection 3 which talks about age limit of a managing director or a whole time director so any managing director or a whole time director above the age of 70 uh, shall require the approval of the shareholders by special resolution so if you see the um uh, sebi listing regulation there is a provision for non executive director and 75 years and if you see the companies act section 196 it provides for executive directors and the age is 70 but provisions are by and large the same so even that needs to be checked for promoter 
owned companies and resolution needs to be passed. So these are not annual compliances, but these are important compliances which we need to ensure uh, at any point of time during the year. We can come to the next. So yeah, these are uh, some, uh, you can say, key thresholds which are important that you always need to keep in mind. The thresholds in the Companies Act 1956 have significantly increased as uh, in the company that 2013 have significantly increased as compared to 1956 for the same. So there, there, is, an, there is a threshold for XBRL, uh, which is provided in the rules. Caro has a threshold and lot of exceptions. So there are exceptions like small company, um, private company. Again, there is a lot of bifurcation for private company. So Caro needs to be ensured at the, the threshold, you need to check it at the end of the financial year, 31st of March. So for cash flow, there is no threshold, but cash flow is exempted for uh, quite a few companies, which is a startup company, small company, OPC. So cash flow is exempted for such companies. Then uh, internal auditor's appointment, uh, the thresholds are provided in the rules. Uh, the company secretaries, that is MGT, eight certifications also provided which is even applicable to private companies. Appointment of company secretary in a company is also provided in the section and the rules, rule 8A. The secretarial audit thresholds are also provided uh, to which company the secretarial audit will be applicable. So what I'm trying to just emphasize is that there are compliances other than annual compliances, and these are the list of compliances. So even if you keep a check on the threshold, that will be quite helpful for you in keeping a tap of the compliances. Yeah, because I'll give a very relevant example. Typically in due diligence cases, suppose there is a private company and its capital is suppose in say, in a which is falling under the thresholds. Okay, say suppose the thresholds of internal auditor or you can say the thresholds for uh, appointing a company secretary or thresholds for caro applicability but the company may or may not have complied. These are the red flags in the due diligence of the company because obviously the uh, uh, it, it, it may have an impact on the valuation as well. So let us see. Yeah, so we can go to the next slide. Yeah, even for a woman director, now obviously the woman director is applicable to listed companies and uh, unlisted public companies and independent directors is also uh, independent directors audit and remuneration committee stakeholders committee so practically everything on this slide is applicable to uh, public company and uh, listed or unlisted company except the last point which talks about the csr committee so csr is a since it is a very important aspect and mostly applicable to the companies i will just come to the thresholds because uh, CSR in the recent times have been significantly been amended. And um, so CSR is basically applicable to private company, public company. Interestingly, CSR is also applicable to section eight company, depending on the thresholds. Okay. So every company having a net worth of 500 crores or more or turnover of thousand crores or a net profit of five crores, or more during immediately preceding financial year. So you need to check it as on 31st of March, 2023 for the ongoing year. Then it shall constitute a CSR committee. So these thresholds we need to see. Then there is a provision which says about, there is there are a lot of FAQs that have come up. Though I'll not go into the CSR, but CSR is a very important uh, compliance that is required. And now earlier CSR was, it was comply or explain, but now it is comply or uh, you can say spend. It has become that kind of compliance. And therefore it becomes mandatory to either spend it on CSR or put it in a fund, which is provided by the government. So ultimately the money, which is 2% of the net profit is going to go from the company to the fund, which is maintained by the government. Yeah, so I, maybe it would be a limited, but uh, uh, I thought of taking more questions. So therefore the presentation is limited. 
So maybe we can, I'll open the chat box and uh, maybe take questions. Uh, yeah, is it fine? Yeah, sure. Uh, the first question probably we can start is, uh, is loan to director need to be reported? Uh, like someone had asked in DPT-3, we were, uh, while we were covering DPT-3, someone had asked, is loan to directors to be reported? Not given loan, but I think loan to, which has uh, take, been taken from directors is to be reported. Yeah, loan to director, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if it is loan to director, in my view, uh, it is basically prohibited under section 185, prima facie, because if you go by section 185, subsection one, it says that no company shall give a loan guarantee security to its director, uh, a firm in which director is a partner, relative of a director, and then there is a list of parties. So. Prima facie, the answer is it's prohibited. Secondly, it may be given to a, uh, you can say, a managing director or a whole time director in compliance with section 185 and section 186. That can be given. But again, we need to comply and then give. But in any case, this is not required to be reported in DPT-3 because in DPT-3 DPT is money received by the company and not money paid by the company. So that is the objective of DPT-3. Thank you. The next question is, if a company invests in mutual funds, does it yeah. come under the purview of 186? Yeah. So see, uh, under section 186, it talks about investment in securities of a body corporate. And section 179, subsection 3 talks about investment of funds. Hmm. So there is a distinction between the both. Suppose if a company makes a investment in fixed deposit, then it is investment in the funds. Investment of funds. Yeah. Oh, sorry, investment of funds. And if a company uh, invests in the shares in a stock market, then it will be the um, investment securities in the securities. Yeah. So there 186 will be applicable, but in fixed deposit or any other. Similarly, for mutual funds, if the mutual fund uh, is uh, run or operated or owned by a trust, then it will not be 186 will not be applicable because it is not investment in securities of the body corporate because trust is not a body corporate. So therefore it will not be applicable. But if it is in the securities of a company uh, with the AMC, then, because AMC is a private company, and uh, the trust is the trust trust in the trust, trust form for the purpose of the mutual. Yeah. Next is conservative note. It does fall under one eighty six. So someone has just suggested that it does fall the conservative note. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So therefore, uh, maybe, but it actually depends on how that. Um, investment is made in the mutual funds. If it is through trust, then not. But if it is through company, then yes. Next is, sh should stipulation regarding interest under 186 subsection 7 be seen while providing the loan or it should be revisited at least yearly once due to subsequent increase in interest rate, like the situation we have come across recently. The act is silent on this. Yeah, so... Uh, I'll just refer the section. 186 subsections. So what the provision says is that no company shall be given under this section at a rate of interest lower than the prevailing yield of the year of one year, three year, five year, seven year, 10 year, whatever uh, close. So see, in my view, this giving of loan will be at a time of loan and not at the subsequent time. So at the time of transaction, the loan interest is to be considered. But yes, since this question has been asked uh, and there could be some chartered accountants uh, who would be attending and they are quite, uh, this has become very relevant for them. 
is typically in transfer pricing cases what i've seen is that loan given by a uh, interest interest rates uh, loan given by the indian entity to the foreign entity uh, there could be obviously a change in the interest rate so the foreign interest rates are hardly 1 or 2% or very less as compared to india and in india it is a very uh, the high interest rate but still considering all the facts in my view it can be also given at a lesser interest rate because even the fact says that under section 186 subsection 7 it says that it shall not it shall be the minimum interest rate minimum yeah next is whether ngt 14 required in case of borrowing monies from a debenture holder in case of a private company NGT 14. Yeah, so Fine. see, actually, um, this question has actually two, two, two uh, yeah. sub questions. Uh, if debenture is issued by a private company, uh, the basic question is whether you are considering debenture as a loan or a security. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you are considering as a security, then you will follow what is provided in section forty two. Okay. And if you are considering debenture as a loan. then you will be following only what is given in the debenture provision which is either section 71 72 that provision so if you are considering issue of debenture by a private company as a security security means security is that is share securities bonds yes. that securities then it will be a, a investment in securities and obviously not a loan and therefore reporting will not be required but if you are considering and in a uh, such kind of debenture then it could be you may consider reporting in the dpt3 but in my view this is a situation across not only in the case of dpt3 i'll just give an example in case of a private company investing in the uh, debentures of a another private company or a public company investing in the debentures of a private company so the question is whether the public company is giving a loan to the private company and whether 185 is applicable because if you see section 1 uh, the definition of uh, debentures it talks about acknowledgement of debt so there is a reference of loan and therefore this issue is there but in my view debenture is a security because if you refer the definition of security under company law and securities yeah, contract is. regulation it is a security and therefore it will not the convertible be. part the convertible debentures and all are, yeah. are considered included yeah. in security yes okay. yes sure sir uh, and uh, next question if a private company has incorporated a company in foreign entity and after investing in shares or securities of foreign entity in tranches any filings under nca yeah tranches means uh, means i have not understood the latter part of the question i have understood that there is a foreign entity following foreign. an indian entity let's take an example indian has incorporated in foreign that's what i think the okay. indian company has okay indian entity uh no if tranche is like okay so if india is incorporating a company in singapore and suppose any the authorized and the paid up capital over there is suppose say 1 crore and you are investing in tranches say after every um Maybe in three times you are investing thirty crores, forty crores, forty crores is mm -hmm. the situation. Now, in that case, in my view, if you give a holistic resolution that you can invest up to one crore, then mm -hmm. I think so that is sufficient. Okay. But if you have given the authority of investing only thirty lakhs and not the remaining sixty lakhs, then you would require mm -hmm. the resolution at appropriate point. Separate, yeah, yeah. yeah. If holding shares jointly with the holding company, I think you had covered. Yeah, it yeah, yeah. That was, I think, so in relation to section eighty nine, and a very interesting 18. question and a situation. Yeah. But because what happens, joint shareholder has an interest, and therefore, that interest is created and compliance further compliance would be required. And I think it is in earlier in relation to the earlier question, the foreign company becomes. Only on subsidiary of the Indian private company, any filings to be made by Indian company. Oh, sorry, can you repeat that part? Foreign company becomes 
wholly owned subsidiary of Indian private company, any filings to be made by the Indian company. I think the accounts to be consolidated and all those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the Indian company becomes the holding company. That is the question. Yeah, yeah. Foreign company is the wholly owned subsidiary of the Indian company. Yes, yes. Private. So, yeah, yeah. So, consolidation and everything will be applicable. Will, and uh, even the foreign uh, company will be a subsidiary company. So, it will be a related party under Section 2. RPT. And yeah. RPT provisions may apply. Yeah. And uh, investment. So, whenever they make an investment under Section 186, the provisions may trigger. And next question FC4 form within 60 days of end of financial year. I think that is. Someone yeah. has replied to the yeah, yeah. So yeah, so that is foreign company. So I have not considered yeah. that in the yeah. but yes, that compliance is required. How many meetings to be conducted by section eight company yeah. during that was a, yes, yes, yes. So I'll just come to the notifications part because um there is a fifth June notification, fifth June 2015 notification, and in that there is a provision which says that they can have a, they can have only two meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you refer that point number 14 in that mm -hmm. 5th June 2015 notice, it says that it shall apply to the extent that the board of directors of such company, that is section eight company shall hold at least one meeting within every six calendar. Every month. Six. So, you can have two meetings in a year that is sufficient next question if a whole time director becomes a normal director through being uh, so i'm sorry if a whole time director becomes a normal director through being no longer whether intimation to be done through dir6 or it can be done through sep uh, separate annual dir3 kyc i did not understand yeah i actually uh means i had referred that during mm -hmm. the session okay. but okay. uh yeah i think so what uh he meant was that uh Change there is a full-time director mm -hmm. and he probably resigned as a director mm -hmm. and but still obviously is holding the din so the question so that was, is he required to do the kyc or not uh in my yeah. view uh if it is web kyc he may do it because he may be a director and some other company at a later point of time. Mm. So he may do the compliance, but mm. uh, it's, um, you can say, if if he is not going to be a director in any company at a later point of time at all, then, then in that case. Yeah. Uh, Otherwise, for Dean to be kept active, he may need to yeah. do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next is during COVID times for. Uh, a, FY 2020-21, can the AGM be conducted at 9.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time, keeping in mind the foreign shareholders attending the meeting? Yeah. So, this was uh, one point uh, during the COVID time and even now actually. Uh, considering that it is um, a meeting through VC, but government has not talked anything about the time. So, time they have said that it should be 9 a.m. to 6 p.m but they have not given any leeway for this time. So in my view, 9.30 PM or anything after 6 PM is not allowed even for VC. Uh, because the circular doesn't say anything about the time. Mm -hmm. It only says that they can do it through VC. So quite strange, but yes, that is the situation. Next is auditor's appointment in case of private company is effective from board meeting in which they are appointed or from the date of AGM where the shareholders approve? No. So suppose if it is a first board meeting, it is applicable from the first board meeting. First board. Meeting. Because first board meeting, there is no other option or mm -hmm. shareholders will come only yeah. when the board does appoint. Yeah. Yeah. In the case of subsequent meetings, which is in the uh, first AGM that they appoint. Mm. Yeah. So they will appoint till the sixth AGM. So in that case, it will be the shareholders who will be the ultimate authority. Mm. And the date of appointment would be the shareholders' resolution. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So and the, likewise, yes, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So the cutoff time for compliance, 
which is the most important point is uh, that it will start from the date of aging. Hmm. And uh, follow up question is in case of casual vacancy as well. So which would be the date of appointment, whether the board appoint first and then uh, or then thereafter at the EGM once it is. Confirmed. Yeah, so I'll just refer to 139 because in casual vacancy, there are two parts. Hmm. One is casual vacancy by resignation. By and resignation. one is casual vacancy for any other reason. Hmm. So I will yes. refer to 139. And the as question far as is remember, for resignation. Yes, sir. Yeah. So as far as I remember, whenever there is resignation, uh, within three months, the board should call the shareholders meeting and appoint. And uh, after that, they can appoint for the next five years. So that would be required. Yeah. If there is for anything else, then what 139 says it should be done according with that. Like for example, casual vacancy can be by disqualification of an auditor mm -hmm. that he has not complied with any of the conditions or he has exceeded the number of audits yeah. or there is a casual vacancy maybe due to by death or some other thing. So yeah. that depends. But for resignation, the law is clear. Mm -hmm. But for anything else, the law is provided. It's provided in the law. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry. Is... Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yes, so just to refer that, it is provided in section 139, subsection 8. Eight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Next is, can we have a separate board meeting for circulation of notice of AGM in August 2023 to have a AGM prior to September 30th 2023 while financial approved in the month of May 2023. The date of incorporation is 10th March 2022. Okay. Yeah. So uh, basically he's saying whether the accounts approval meeting can be divided into two parts. Uh, in my view, yes, it can be. Yes, Even if it is in May 2023, uh, they can approve the accounts uh, and uh, we can say the financials, audit report, all can be as on May 2023. And the uh, uh, director's report or maybe director's report can also be part of the first uh, awesome. meeting that is in May 2023. And the subsequent part which is only issue of notice that can be done later on. Separate board. Yeah. yeah. Interestingly, what uh, I did for one of my clients, there are two, two, three, or two options that we have. Okay. Uh, in the May meeting only, you give an authority to the company secretary or a director saying that he can issue the notice, right? And the decision will be taken. Hmm. This is not convenient. Then you can even issue the notice by passing a circular resolution. Hmm. Hmm. Means you can even do this by passing a circular resolution because issue of notice of AGM doesn't require a specific board meeting. Mm -hmm. This is my personal view because, yeah. but I'm not, um, I need to confirm with the secondary standards, but other than that, this is possible. Yeah. Next is, M is MGT 14 for AGM, which is held through video conferencing, yeah. need to be filed within 30 days or 60 days. As per NCA circular earlier, it was 60 days. Yeah. So very uh, appropriate question, but the issue, but to answer the question, it is 30 days. Okay. Because MCA circuit, uh, the MDT 14 doesn't understand that whether you are filing for uh, AGM, AGM or through VC yeah. or special resolution or anything else. So even if the circular says 60 days, uh, is, you need to do it within it 30, 30 days. days. So many things get triggered after the first AGM. Uh, firstly, it is uh, AOC 4, then it is MDT 7, a MDT 8 if applicable, then ADT 1, then MDT 14 for such companies where they do it through VC. So these compliances get triggered immediately. Other than that, if it is section 42 compliance, then that is the next compliance. So, yeah. Is there any limitation for appointment of auditor for number of years? Like in 2023, we uh, can we appoint auditor for next five years in the same ADT one form? 
no uh, can you repeat the question is there any limitation for appointment of auditors for number of years for example in 2023 can we appoint auditors for the next 5 years in the same edt1 form i think that is in line with the section yeah yeah i think so see uh, if we go by that section 139 they provide in fact that they have removed the ratification for every year mm -hmm. so we can appoint for 5 years 5 years at a time yeah five yeah years so if you go by i'll just refer to section subsection 1 of 139 it mm. says subject to the provisions of the chapter every mm. company shall at the first agm appoint an individual or a firm who shall hold office from the conclusion of that meeting mm. till the conclusion of the sixth agm so mm. and thereafter every thereafter till the conclusion of every sixth meeting mm. and the manner and procedure all is given in the law so this yeah. this is possible this is possible yeah yeah can public limited company give salary to its non executive director more than the limit prescribed by schedule 5 by passing special resolution all shareholders are interested as all shareholders are family members shall we go for cg approval yeah so managerial remuneration is a very interesting topic and to quickly answer your question answer is yes uh, yes means you can do it um but i will need some more details yeah, why so, okay. is because if it is a public company we need to know whether it is in profit or in loss okay yeah. if it is in profit then you have uh, two options to pay non executive director you can pay 1% or 3% yeah. now in most of the companies there is an executive director and therefore they are paid 1% of the net profit okay but by passing a special resolution you can increase the percentage that is provided in the section 197 mm. other than that if the company is into loss then you need to uh, check the schedule 5 yeah, which is which uh, the participant has referred yeah uh, but i think even under that there is no restriction uh, as far as i understand if they uh, pass the resolution uh, i think the participant can then check up uh, oh. offline with further details so then yeah because uh, means i have understood the query but yeah. it has got lot of sub questions yeah. to the query it's and buts lot of yeah yeah uh, next is what are the consequences if implementing agency does not utilize the funds by march 31st to the selected project due to any reason yeah. under csr yeah so a uh, very common question and very common issue actually because uh, implementing agencies are there are three agencies and to answer your question practically it's um, difficult for company to track it down unless they take a utilization certificate from them but even in the utilization certificate they will not be able to provide the necessary details so uh, in my view that may amount to csr non compliance but again that would depend a lot on the facts that what exactly has happened that the situation has occurred like for example in the case of um, uh, some companies uh due to covid reason they were not able to do it or uh, the project the implementing agency had some other uh, liquidation issues so uh, they need to see about how the, the reason but yeah uh from the perspective of compliance of 135 in my view compliance would be done would be complete because company has given the amount to the implementing agents next is how to treat remuneration paid by for foreign wholly owned company to director how okay. to treat remuneration paid by foreign wholly owned company to director okay okay so i think so the question is that uh, there is a indian company that indian company has a foreign wholly owned subsidiary foreign, foreign. Mm -hmm. and that foreign wholly owned subsidiary is paying the indian director mm -hmm. who may be a director of the holding company as well yeah mm -hmm. that could be a situation so yeah. uh now i am considering that it, it is a private company <laughs> because uh, means 
but it will not matter whether it is a private or a public company because the paying entity is a foreign company. So, foreign. yeah. So, I don't think there would be a compliance over here. Next is loan by subsidiary company to holding company, whether it is to be reported under 185, 186. <laughs> subsidiary yeah. to holding. Yeah. So, uh, I think so. The question is that subsidiary company is giving a loan to the holding company. That is broadly the question. Yeah. So uh, if you see section 185, this exact transaction doesn't fall under any of the provisions of section 185. Uh, section 185 is actually divided into three parts, four parts. First is that subsection it completely prohibits. Subsection two allows, but subject to two conditions. Okay. And subsection three exempts, but subject to two conditions. And subsection four is a penal provision. In all the four or all the three subsection, this transaction doesn't fall. But this transaction may require uh, approval uh, under subsection two. But that depends on facts of case, which companies are involved, private company, public company, who are the directors, what is their shareholding, all that will be required to check the compliance. So prima facie answer is yes, but to go in detail, it is subject to terms and condition or an asterisk. Next question is probably relating to the recent amendment in CSR. So the question is, is if CSR is applicable to a company for a particular year, then will it be applicable for the coming years or does company need to check applicability on year to year basis? No, no. See, uh, I think so. There is now a bit of clarity. Uh, and the clarity is provided in the rules. Mm. You have to check it to answer our question. Firstly, you need to check it on yearly basis. Okay. Mm. Which the threshold that I mentioned, threshold. net profit, net worth and uh, the capital. Okay. I will refer to the CSR rules. They have introduced a provision. What they say is that earlier what they said was that if the provisions are not applicable for three years, still you need to maintain the committee policy and everything. Yeah, sorry. So we need to see the CSR provision. So in the CSR provisions, there is an amendment introduced to this effect, which I was just referring to. And that covers your question. Just one minute. I'll just check if possible. Is it fine or? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Uh -huh. You can. Yeah, if you see the CSR rules, uh, yeah, maybe uh, need to check, but yeah, there is a provision yeah. now provided in the CSR rules hmm. Hmm. that what is to be done in case of non applicability. Hmm. Rule 3 sub rule 2 is omitted, I think. Uh, that's what uh, I understand, which which provided for this that. Uh, so probably for next year, if it is not applicable, even then we need to spend just in like uh, we have in XBRL that once it becomes applicable, you need yeah. to uh, check for this. Yeah, correct, correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, sub rule 2, they have deleted. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. And there is a reference in the section also. Mm. That is also required. So, yeah. yeah. So, section and rules, if we read, there could be, mm. but I feel there is now a clarity on this. Earlier, there clarity. was compliance mm. even after non applicability. Yeah. yeah. Next is uh, is CA certificate man, uh, required mandatorily for DPT 3 for deposit acceptance? Yeah. If you take deposits, which are public yeah. deposits, it's required. It is. Uh, if it is for private companies, then not required. But yeah, sorry, in the exempted deposit, there is a provision of audited. Means there is a passing reference of audited in the rule 16. Mm -hmm. So that creates a lot of confusion. 
Hmm. So practically audit is not possible in quite a few companies till the month of June. So that could be one of the issues. But even if you get it confirmed, what we generally do is we get it confirmed from the auditor that whether this is correct or not. Then based on that, the compliance can be done. Hmm. Next is the aggregate amount during the year and balance outstanding at the balance sheet date with respect to such loans or advances and guarantees or security to parties other than subsidiaries, joint ventures and associates. This is to be reported in CARO other than subsidiaries, joint ventures and associates can consider related party where party to advances to company is subsidiary of holding company, then same can consider as other than subsidiary joint venture or associate. It's not very clear, I think. Uh, it's like the query, I, I think yeah. uh, we can proceed and probably- uh, No, just one point, yeah, yeah. I, I understood to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, see, in section 186, what he is referring to, uh, mm. there is a provision which says that uh, investment in associate subsidiary, wholly owned subsidiaries will not be counted. Not be. So, mm. I think so. It is section 186, uh, subsection mm. 2, and in that there is a proviso, and that mm. proviso it excludes those entities. Mm. So, I have understood, means I have understood the question yeah. up to 186. But I'm not Caro, so he is referring to Caro, whether it is to be yeah. reported in Caro in a case where uh, other than subsidiary joint venture or associate can consider it as related party for advances to company. I did not understand. This is to be yeah, reported yeah. in Caro. Huh? I, I mean, um, as far as I remember, in hmm. Caro, hmm. you have to uh, report what whether the company has complied with the provisions of loan guarantee security under mm. section 186. Mm. Okay. Mm. Now in 186 subsection 3 and the proviso, there is an exception created. That is what he is referring to. Mm. But the latter part of the question I have not understood. So yeah. Yeah. maybe... Probably we can check later and if we can redraft and send probably then we can answer. Okay. Yeah, uh, we will proceed. If the private company voluntarily appoints KMP, then does it need to comply with the provisions applicable to the KMP, such as filing M MR1 for appointment of MD, WTD sections pertaining to remuneration and uh, other sections? Yeah, think, so yes. this is, a, in my view, yes, because the KMPs have been appointed because the appointment will be done under 203, section 203. Mm -hmm. So in that case, the compliance will trigger, even if it is not applicable. Mm -hmm. Next is complete change in the foreign parent. How should this be reported in a company exact by the Indian subsidiary? Uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat? Complete change in the foreign parent. How uh, should this be reported under company exact by Indian subsidiary? Probably the holding company would have changed or there would have yeah, been yeah, some yeah. change. In correct, correct. Got it. So, this has happened in quite a few client companies where the uh, parent company has been taken over by the another entity and there is a name change. Mm -hmm. But there is just the name change. There is no further activity. So we take a, if there is a name change and obviously we take the regulatory filings done by that company. We take a letter from the company and if there is no transfer per se and just change in the name of the company, we take in or take it on record on the in the board meeting and make the changes in the share certificate, make an entry in the register of members, and that is sufficient. But if there is a transfer of shares of the parent company, means the parent company is holding shares in subsidiary company, and uh, due to the transfer in the parent company, uh, there is a you can say transfer involved, then that needs to be done in accordance with. Company law and FEM. Okay. Uh, next, I think you have uh, already answered. Do we need to disclose about the trust in MBP1? For example, yeah. director becoming trustees. Yes, that is required. <laughs> yeah. Uh, loan by a foreign holding company to Indian subsidiary, whether ECB rules applicable. 
loan by foreign company foreign holding company to indian subsidiary company uh, yes it is required because it's borrowing by it the is. indian entity yes. and it is a recognized lender yeah. under yeah. the ecb regulation yeah is dpt3 applicable to section 8 company yeah yeah no exception yeah. except what is provided in the rules yeah if company has hold uh, who time direct i think uh, the person means whole time director but yeah. they have authorized another director as officer in default under gnl3 in case default happens then which person will be held responsible the person who is officer or in default or the etd or both yeah i'm just reading that part just one minute yeah yeah in my view it will be see if you go by the section which is the officer in default section it will be ultimately the will... first the person who is made responsible Mm. and whole time director i don't think there is a exemption for whole time director mm. means they are by default considered but if yeah. they have made the person authorized person then it will be first that and then it will yeah. be the whole time director yeah next is uh, upload of mgt7 on website is applicable on section 8 company also under yeah. section 92 yes next is if uh, i think this is uh, acha the earlier question i think which is redrafted if a whole time director becomes normal director but no longer being employee of the company but still continuing with directorship whether din 6 need to be filed or it can be done through year 3 uh, kyc but yeah. I, i think it is sufficient sufficiently answered uh, this yeah. uh, Uh, the dr3 yes. kyc thing yeah uh, whether gnl2 is required to be filed now for pass 4 pass 5 in case of private company no but why why gnl2 is required gnl2 i uh -huh. exactly i think so under the old rules that was required it i don't was, think it under was. the new rules it is required now no longer yeah uh, please share your email id for question relating to remuneration to non executive okay. director it will be i think posted okay, okay. Uh, yeah is caro applicable to liaison office uh no i need to check the caro provisions yes, yes. prima facie or even giving answer is difficult so yes. i need to check the caro and then i need to answer yes. uh next is can you clarify more on maintenance of register for rpt transactions i think that is yeah, under yeah, section so, 189 yeah so see basically um if you refer to section 189 you have to maintain the register for two reasons or two provisions one is under section 184 subsection 2 where there is a specific interest involved and another is under section 188 these are the only two reasons where you have to maintain for the first point you need to check the board meeting where there is a interested director in the second point you need to see the uh, provisions of um, Uh, 188, which we just discussed now. Okay, so yeah. if it is a means, I don't, I'm not understanding whether it is a private or public company. But mm. if it is a private company having transaction with its holding company, then those are exempted from uh, 188 because section two subsection 76 is not applicable. So mm. considering two subsection 76 is not applicable, 188 is not applicable because of the 189 is not applicable. Means they need not be recorded in the minutes. Mm. Okay. that is one second if it is a transaction with some other party where it is uh, not required where there is no exemption that is there then when you approve it in the board meeting after the board meeting you need to enter in the register which is provided in section 189 of the rules that is broadly on the maintenance of register mm. next is can a company take loan from llp under intercorporate loan can a company take a loan from llp no it is not an inter corporate loan because mm. the in section in the uh, deposit rule it says a company giving loan to another company it is inter corporate means it's inter company loan so that will not be there means this provision will not be applicable in fact in my view company cannot take a loan from llp mm. because mm. means i'm saying a private company can't take a loan mm. 
mm-hmm. because it is not in the exempted transaction mm-hmm. it is not a director it is not a shareholder so it will be a third party not yeah. i think that uh, uh, we are through to the questions i think uh, uh, any any further questions we'll just wait for a minute or so and then yeah can you please throw light again on the query with respect to disclosure of trusteeship in gratuity trust in mbp1 the the person who has logged off by mistake i think yes uh, that will yeah. have to be disclosed which has been clarified uh, what is this loan to subsidiary of holding company loan to subsidiary of holding company is considered as other than subsidiary is joint venture and associate is that correct interpretation loan to a subsidiary of holding company is considered as other than subsidiary joint venture and associate like a fellow subsidiary okay. company that's that's loan what you may be intending this, this is relating to probably that caro uh, this query which was there so i think so there is a question by mr rajesh i'll just refer that yes sir <clears throat> loan to subsidiary of a holding company yeah so holding company is giving loan to subsidiary other subsidiary so like fellow subsidiary so is it to be considered as a loan to subsidiary associate joint venture or other than to subsidiary associate joint venture that is what he may be asking in caro provisions okay no in my view if it is a fellow subsidiary but how will the fellow means i don't think that will be applicable hmm hmm oh yeah section eight that... company needs to hold uh, one board meeting one board the... meeting okay. every six months of calendar year is it fine with if one meeting is held in jan and other in december or do we need to make sure that gap between two does not exceed six months yeah it is desirable Same. that gap doesn't exceed Yeah. because ultimately um, means it's actually not only about compliance but it's more from the perspective of that directors are also involved so yeah. so i think that uh, brings us to the end of this session a uh, very wonderful sessions and with uh, queries uh, like multiple queries and uh, i am cs raj kapadia uh, would like to propose a hearty vote of thanks to the speaker cs gaurav pingle ji who has covered the topic such a vast topic relating to compliances across different forms of the entities whether it is private company one person company section 8 companies uh, or e- even private companies which are subsidiaries of public company so uh, like various touch points were covered in a very short duration of a uh, hardly two hours session but multiple touch points were covered whether it is the basic definition of financial year to all the compliances including convertible notes for startups which are, which uh, is a unique concept and he, he made sure to cover it including the deposit the exempted deposits the related party transactions meetings and the compliances which are required after the meetings whether it is the beneficial ownership and uh, sir as a convener of the commercial allied law committee your suggestion relating to a separate session on beneficial ownership itself is also well taken and uh, we really thank you for this session it it was the first session of this committee for the year 2023 24 and like well begun is half done and we had almost 125 over than like more than 125 participants throughout the two hour session so that was really uh, like uh, uh, thank you very much for the session and uh, malika ma'am would you like to add something so to it was an absolutely great beginning for us and thank you gorav sir for being being present for us yeah thank you and uh, thank you cs raj and uh, miss malika devendra and uh, bautik kasha uh, and also all the committee members Uh, all our co committee members and uh, uh, harish sir as well as um, um, dharan sir 
for inviting me it was a great experience and look forward to meet you all uh, at some occasion thank you thank you so much thank you very much uh, thank you very much thank you participants thank you. for the session and we will be back with many more st such study circle meetings and sessions announcement will follow uh, stay tuned and see you all soon thank, thank you, you thanks a lot thank you, thank you. Thank you.